Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Plectroverse. My name is John Tron Davidson from Heavy Repping, and I am here, here indeed, yes, with James from Northern Ghosts. James, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Oh, absolutely. It's uh, I'm I'm just ashamed it's taken me so long to get you on, to be honest. Yeah, I'll be honest. Uh, I ever since I was uh, just collecting picks, I had some sort of hope that I would be able to get in some kind of an interview with you. <laughs> uh, so it's exciting to be able to do it. Well, I'm finally. I'm absolutely thrilled to have you on, and and so much has happened. So much has happened since your uh, days of collecting. Um, it's almost yes. kind of hard to. It's almost hard to get your head around now. Uh, before we get into this, I just want to say a big congratulations because you are coming up on, um, essentially, because we're coming up on the shop anniversary on the 18th of March, that yes. that'll be the full fat anniversary of Northern Ghost as a Yeah, Northern as an Ghost entity. will be a whole year. How is it, How is that? How does that feel? Um, it's gone by pretty quick because I've been sort of making picks for a couple of years and uh, making picks was never something I intended or planned, even though I collected them for a while. So, um, it, it's gone by pretty fast and sort of crazy. And this is a question I was going to ask you later, but did you think that when you got started, obviously you're, you're very well known in the pick scene, but did you think uh, that when you got started, your stuff would end up all over the world as far as India, the U S and, and, and all that sort of stuff? No, and it was like definitely a surprise because when I started making them, it was just a, uh, it was just like a quick little side hobby. So I I never intended to sell them, but then I had people ask me, you know, when is this going to be for sale? So to think of all over the world where my picks have gone is kind of crazy. And I actually very rarely sell within my own uh, country in Canada. (laughs) So. It's kind of crazy to think where my picks have ended up. There's more picks outside of Canada than there is within it. <laughs> Nevertheless, though, it does kind of speak to it speaks to the work that you've done, and you've got that you've got your whole own aesthetic and everything going on with Northern Ghost that you kind of had more or less since day one. There's a, a cuter style to the way you lay everything out. It's not as functional as everybody else's. Yeah, I kind of try to put my own uh, love and personality into it. Um, you know, I try to, I'm more keen on making something crazy and weird than I am making something look very professional. <laughs> I think you're doing yourself a little bit of a disservice there, but uh, I've, <laughs> yeah. I've seen your finishing and I've got some of your earliest stuff, which is so far, even in those early days, I can, you can see. Everybody in the scene kind of knew that that was, you know, there was something special going on there. But the gap between um, where you were when you started making and the stuff you're making now is so, so wide. And I don't say that as, I don't say that as like, because you sell through the shop and I don't say say that as like, um, you know, somebody who owns your picks. I'm looking at it objectively as a collector. And somebody who right, sees this stuff all the time, it's ridiculous. Um, mm-hmm. What what got you started in, in doing it? I know you said you've been doing it a long time, but... Well, uh, you know, obviously I was a collector for, a few, like, pretty much since I started playing guitar and bass. But the thing that actually physically got me into the making of picks itself was sort of, you know, unintentional. I had a guitar where the string nut had broken, and I decided, well, that will be a fun little craft project. I'll try making uh, my own guitar nut. And it went horribly, failed. But I was in a situation where I had all the tools in front of me to make a guitar pick. I had the bone. I had the files. I had all sorts of crazy stuff. And so I, everyone throughout my collecting days always said, well, why don't you make them? Start making your own picks. I'm sure you've gotten that same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... I just decided, okay, I'll try it. If it goes horribly, then it goes horribly. And I can just say I tried it. And, you know, whether I liked it or not, it turned out I made a few picks that were functional and I'm still pretty proud of. And ever since then, it just didn't stop. I just found this, you know, I would take a couple of weeks where I didn't make another pick and then I would feel like I need to go do that again. 
Mm. And it just sort of kept escalating to where I am now, to where I have a full lineup that I, I even a year ago, wouldn't have expected to have. <laughs> and you started off making with, um, and I, I remember the, the very first post you were doing about picks on making your own picks on Instagram, and you started off mm-hmm. with Bone, didn't you? Yes, which I don't recommend as a starting material. <laughs> I, I still have, There's a reason <laughs> I have not gone back to making Bone. Yeah. Uh, the first pick I made out of Bone, I made with a hacksaw, a huge metal file that is not meant to be held by human hands, for sure, um, and a power sander, which I don't even use those things anymore. Um, so it was really just like this, just hacking away at the Bone until I got a you know, good pick out of it. So I do not recommend Bone to anyone starting out, but it was a good challenge. I will say that. It's a proper smell as well. That um, It's kind of like burnt chalk. It, it, yeah, I was using cow bone, specifically a bone from a cow leg. That's meant to be a dog bone. And it smells like steak the entire time you're making it, but oh, not a pleasant oh, oh. steak. A uh, mm. steak that's been sitting out. Oh. Well, yeah, that's uh, that's very positive. Um, but you're <laughs> <laughs> you're now using uh, you're doing uh, acrylic and kerenite and ultem and and all that sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah, acrylic is what I was sort of like what, in my collecting days. Even when I would try crazy materials like UHMWP and any other material, I would always go back to acrylic, and that was just the good spot for me in yeah. collecting and in making. It's been the same thing. Um, when I sit down to play guitar, that's what I use. So that's sort of what I gravitate to when I make picks. Now, speaking of uh, the early days and you you coming into all of this, um, obviously you were collecting beforehand. But what were the? Mm-hmm. And we'll, we'll I'll give you the horrible top three question later because everybody gets that. <laughs> but what what were your what were your inspirations? Who who and what were your inspirations when you were coming into making rather than collecting? Uh, I'd say it was like this need to provide something better because when I was collecting, it was always like this. I was always shocked when people weren't aware, I guess, or didn't think that far into their guitar picks. So for me, it was about trying to trying to create something that I love and that I think uh, makes the guitar world a bit better. Um, and something kind of funny is when me and you first started talking, I was a little confused because I had never talked to somebody who cared as much about guitar picks as I felt I did. So I was very confused when me and you first started talking. I was like, why does someone else care about picks as much as I do? (laughs) So uh, it's always, I guess, been this thing about trying to, you know, figure out why I care more about guitar picks than I do pedals or anything else. Yeah. And why do you, I mean, obviously you've, you've now been on both sides of the, I've never made picks, right? So mm. that's, that. I always find this bit really interesting, but now that you have made, and obviously you still collect picks from other people, um, mm. but now that you've made your own, as well as collecting other people's, do you, do you still you, you still use your own when you're playing, or do you? Uh, yes, that has been sort of that? like a recent revelation, I'd say. Like uh, for the first, I've been doing making picks like around two years, and it hasn't been until the past couple months that I actually sat down and I made myself picks that I intended to make for myself because hmm. it just picked up so fast to where like I have my first few picks I made, but the majority of what I made in the past couple of years, I just. I just sold and I just didn't really have the chance to sit down and make myself proper picks for myself. So I always kept my, you know, B stock scraps, but up until recently, I was just dissatisfied with that. I wanted to have the same experience, you know, my customers and everyone else were having. So I finally sat down and I made myself my own picks. And what's what's the shape you're going? Because we'll talk about the vintage thing in a minute. But what's the shape you go for for yourself? Uh, it's really the Uno. The Uno is the thing that I sort of, you know, uh, people kind of 
it's the odd thing people know me for. And yeah. so it's sort of the thing I prefer to use uh, in my own playing, but I also use the cloud and the ghost quite a bit. Yeah, the cloud's my um, the cloud's my personal favorite out of the stuff you do. And I am pretty proud of it. Oh, it's it's what it's genuinely because it, it, it's an old it, it is an effect, and uh, those of you, I mean, I'd be surprised if anybody listening to this doesn't know what we're talking about. But the it, you've been very open um, about the inspiration you've taken from the vintage stuff, like especially the old the, the case of the cloud, the old Andrea three four seven. Uh, which is the widest shape they ever made, right? Um, but the I know the the Uno also comes from a similar. It's like an old mandolin double end sort of pick, and it's it's your take on it. That I've got the old mm. ones, and they're way longer and less practical. Mm. But what made you want to do? Because you were doing like three, four, sixes, and, and or your variant thereof. But what made you want to go and do the drawing more from the vintage stuff? Because I think, uh, similar to guitars themselves, there's a lot of there's a lot of impracticality and practicality in vintage stuff. Um, like, look at the reverse flying V. It's a ridiculous, <laughs> stupid thing that was yeah. once made, but people still want it and use it for a reason. But then there's also things like the Telecaster, which is extremely practical and people still use. And so mm. I sort of try and draw from both of that so the uno uh i can't remember the vintage i think it's a 366 361 in that range and mm. like you mentioned it's very impractical looking um and it's originally a mandolin pick so i sort of enjoy the challenge of trying to make that in a modern form that can work for a different instrument so mandolin versus electric guitar yeah for sure um, the of the stuff that you've made so far, I know you've you spent the last sort of year establishing um, a very firm, quite broad range of styles with the ghost and uh, the boo, like the limited runs you've done. But mm. of late, with you branching out into your own, you're making your own your own own stuff now mm -hmm. with the beast and uh, that uh, like the planchette sort of like the larger planchette and all that sort of thing with the holes yeah. and everything um, did you find it or rather how did you find it in terms of your feelings about your own work and your own craft because you're still hand making everything so going from going from uh, some fairly orthodox styles and then into vintage styles and then making your own things how did that process go and how does it feel to be making your own definitively your own shapes uh, it's, it feels a lot better to have my own stuff that I would, if I saw on a, you know, if someone else was making the Uno, I genuinely feel like I would have bought that and loved it. And it's important to me to have a sort of a balance between what people do enjoy and love and what I can put myself into. So I make the Planchette Mini, which is a Jazz 3 size and meant to be my version of a Jazz 3. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't personally use jazz threes myself. So it's kind of about finding the balance between what I love and a, what I want to make and what I'm passionate about and what the guitar community as a whole is going to actually use and enjoy. Yeah, that's quite an inter it's quite an interesting dichotomy. Um, mm -hmm. because like people like Brock, for example, B uh, Brock at BHL, for those of you who might have missed that <laughs> for some reason, uh, Brock doesn't play picks at all uh, and, I did not know uh, that yeah he doesn't use picks at all and interestingly Will Hoover of picks book fame he was a fingerstyle player he didn't use picks either right um, but I, I find that fascinating that it's uh, when somebody doesn't use because the jazz the jazz three is kind of like the tube screamer of our world exactly like every Every maker's got to make a, a version thereof. But for you not to be... It doesn't mean you can't make a good Jazz 3. That'd be ridiculous. But like, um, the community as a whole, if you're, not, if you're not using that thing, but you still want to craft that thing, but then you go and make this other thing for yourself. Yeah, exactly. Like that, um, 
So like yeah. the Beast, for example, it's uh, very, it, as far as the guitar pick goes, it's very odd. And so I have to offer the Jazz 3 as my sort of gateway to people of being like, okay, here's a, here's a Jazz 3, but have you tried this? And there's an Uno, there's the Beast. Uh, so it's kind of difficult to uh, market guitar picks as a whole to, you know, the average player. And I have people who buy my picks that they'll play with uh, their fingers when they're trying to record, but they'll use my picks for the actual practical playing in live or wherever. Now, did you have, uh, I, I've spoken to you plenty in the past about music um, and the styles of music that you're into. Did you have that in the back of your mind or when you were choosing the picks you were going to do? Did you um, want it to be used for a particular style, or do you not? That's the difficult that? thing with picks, is you can design a pick for metal, and the a country blues player will find it as their favorite pick in the world. Or you can design something that's meant for a mandolin, and someone uh, playing hardcore black metal will pick it up, and it'll be their yeah. favorite thing. So, <laughs> really, it's that's where it's sort of a... Just, you just design something, and... You have to market it as a whole. Like uh, uh, my ghost, I think of it as a metal pick very much, except I can't market it to metal players because it's not pointy. It's not a jazz three. So it's really about just getting the picks to people and hoping that they find a spot with it, you know? Yeah, no, I I completely get that. It's a bit like saying, you know, um, we're going to make the... Like the tube that coming back to the tube screamer, that's cropped up everywhere from your blue stuff to your John Mayers to your like your boyfriend bring me the horizon uses one as a booster and, and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. You can't really dictate how it's gonna go. But it's interesting to think like if you're into a particular style, that bleeds into your creativity when you're crafting something. Right. Um now, important question for you. Mm-hmm. Very important question. You're looking at your own range now. Not with the stuff that's coming down the pipeline, whatever that is, but you're looking at your own range now and of all the models you've made, I know you you love the Uno, obviously, it's your own pick, but if you were if you're going to choose one thing from the Northern Ghost range that in kind of encapsulates as best it can what Northern Ghost is about, what you as a maker are about, what would you choose? That is really tough because there's, like I mentioned, I offered the Jazz 3 and Planchette Standard because they're so close to a what most people know as a standard guitar pick. But obviously the Uno and the uh, even the Gravestone are what I sort of put myself into and am passionate about. So if I were to give a player just anything that would be their gateway into my picks or just boutique picks in general it would i guess it would just have to be the planchette standard because it's uh very much close to what i think is familiar to most players but still with my own self put into it yeah um now your experience as a maker right Mm -hmm. um i know you said you came from using not practical stuff to make your picks with and that's um that's actually quite or relatively common i think mm-hmm. in the game like uh nads from arcanum started off using huge totally impractical machinery to make his tiny tiny little picks with right um but you're still uh you're still doing you're still are you still cutting everything from the sheets by hand yeah i use a hacksaw the saw to cut a blank, essentially, draw my shape onto it, take it over to a belt sander, and shape it like that. And then from there, the beveling is all done with a hand file and sandpaper. That's re- that's crazy, man! Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> some of the well, some of the because there's things like um, the Uno, for example, and uh, like the Boo that I had off you. Mm-hmm. Um, the Boo is a fantastic little thing. And I I know it's essentially a gravestone with with bits missing, but to know that to know the way you're making it and the finishing you're doing is just it, it just just cracks me up because some of the stuff I was talking to Rick at Honey the other day, 
about the finishing they do. And they're doing everything with CNC and lasers and, you know, they still hand finish them, but all that detail is, you know, there's a lot of machinery involved. And right. for you to be doing it by hand is just absolutely cracking. That's what sort um, of tells me I'm passionate about it because I'm still, yeah, I would, I would love to uh, invest in that equipment, uh, CNC or laser eventually. But what tells me I'm mm-hmm. still passionate and loving it is that I'm still doing it the hard way, sort of. So to speak, um, <laughs> cutting it by a hacksaw yeah. and all that. Yeah, doing it the old fashioned. Because you still hold them in a vice and everything, don't you? Yeah, the vices. I s- sit on that vice the entire time, basically. <laughs> now, if you it, of all the um, of all the materials you're working with now, I know you said acrylics. You're kind of that's your uh, logical home for all of this. I know you've talked in the past about doing casing and um, moving into other materials and so on. But of all the stuff you've worked with, well, this is two questions really. Of all the stuff you've worked with so far, what's your most what's your most enjoyable to work with rather than your favourite? Um, and what have you got on the horizon that you want to work with? Uh, my favourite that I've worked with has really been doing sort of more specialty stuff. So either combining layers of acrylic or I've done the sprinkle resin thing. Um, Yeah, those are cool. And I've gotten my friend to make me some resin sheets recently. And it's just resin. I view a little bit more differently. Resin is a bit more of like a trying to make this massive, you know, beautiful looking thing. Whereas when I'm making an acrylic pick, it's more like, okay, this is down to the practicality. So, and there's been stuff I've worked with that I'm I don't necessarily use myself, but people love like Ultem. So mm. I'd say the sprinkle stuff has been my favorite to sort of work with and most enjoyable. But then there's stuff like Ultem, which I don't enjoy working with as much, but people people buy and they love. No, for sure. Um, and down the road. Are you hoping to do Kaysen and, and Galith? Yeah, and all that sort of stuff? Kaysen and Galith has been something that it's it's been next on the agenda and then just skipped over. <laughs> um, it's I'm sort of someone who works very much in the moment, so when I do the Kaysen Galith stuff, it's going to be a sort of in the moment sort of thing. I'm going to just have a you know 4 a.m. revelation of like, okay, I'm ready to do this. Let's do it, sort of yeah. thing. I don't plan out long road sort of yeah um but you have done uh you have done a couple of limited runs yes um which are really cool the evangelion ones uh i thought were fab Mm -hmm. and um i was kind of hoping you might do them again if i'm honest yeah i would love to Uh, do this once again um and that's sort of where it's like you know i'm passionate about doing this and i I'll do something whether it's going to be super popular or not, sort of. Well, I think that's the right attitude to take because if you're not excited about it, I know you're really into it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it. We wouldn't be having this chat. Mm-hmm. But like, if you you got to keep you got to keep a reason for you to be excited. Yeah. Um, you did a Pokemon. See, you did Pokemon and you did Evangelion. Mm-hmm. Um. And have you got it? Do, do you? I know you say you don't plan these things out down the road, but do you think about that, or do you, are you just sitting at the bench going, "Actually, it'd be quite cool if I did this." It, it's pretty much that way. It's pretty much sitting at the bench. Sometimes I'll just sit there, um, not doing anything, and just think, "Okay, this is what's happening." I'll see the colors and think, "Yeah, I love that color combo," and just in that moment is when I decide I need to do that. So from your <laughs> and this is a bit of an odd question for somebody who's been um oh maybe it's maybe it's the perfect question for somebody who's been doing it the length of time you've been doing it. If you're gonna if you're gonna give somebody who wants to make picks advice on uh, getting their feet in the door and getting on with this, um now that you've had a bit of time to make, you know, a diverse range of stuff and everything if you were going to give somebody who's just starting out making picks any advice, what would that be? 
don't be afraid to do what everyone else is doing in order to get your foot in the door. Um, I still have people come to me and ask me to make them a custom Jazz XL. Um, even though everyone else makes a Jazz XL, people will come to you and they'll be interested because you're doing it and you're passionate about it and not because you're... Don't try to be a perfectionist about it because you'll be surprised what people want from you and what people will come to you for when they could go to anyone else for it. That is sound advice, actually. Um, and you're doing it with fairly fairly minimal tools as well to get the results that you do. Yeah, it's, I, I slowly have been over time adding more and more to the process. Like I use a Dremel to get the horns and the beast, um, but still everything mm. is pretty, you know, bare bones, I'd say. <laughs> now, you're, uh, you're obviously somebody who's very well known in our in our scene mm -hmm. and I don't like to I don't like to make people uncomfortable with this question but everybody gets it because I think it's fair. right of everyone you've collected uh -huh. and all the guys you've played and in terms of the scene the now and everything who's your top three guys that's doing the good work I thought about this for quite a bit before this uh, little <laughs> interview <laughs> and I sort of got a few in front of me here. Um, the one I can't mention because he's sort of going through a transition and he's not making picks at the moment. I would have loved to give him a shout as my number one, but I will have to save that for the future. Um, the three that I really pick up and use when I'm going to play guitar and I'm using someone else's pick. Um, lately, it's been the Zen pick that I got. Um, mm. There's... Uh, Honey picks, but one person whose stuff I collect and I don't use, well, I guess I haven't gotten any new ones in a while, is Crow's Customs. I He is the person yeah. who I'll get something from and I just can't use it because I think it's just, I, it's too nice to use. Uh, I have one pick that I got from him a long time ago that's still in pristine brand new condition because I just, I think it's too nice to use and it's a wooden pick, so I, it, as soon as I use it, it's going to wear, unfortunately. So yeah. he's sort of the number one as far as like beauty and inspiration goes. Um, Honey Picks, as far as like, I think he does an excellent job at creating something unique. His shapes are his own shapes, but they're not so out there that the guitar community as a whole is going to be afraid of it, I'd say. And Zen, just as far as like, Overall, just perfection goes. I have a pick here that I got from him uh, a couple months ago. We did a trade, and I hadn't tried his stuff prior, and I am completely just shocked by the quality of it. Yeah, Dunk's stuff is ridiculous, man. Like, he, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's nuts. And it, it's nuts to have so many heavy guys in the scene now. Like, uh, even a year ago, we... Uh, the distance that people like Michelle from Mean Tone or um, like Nads from Arcanum or any of these guys, like how far everybody's come in that mm -hmm. time is really, really, it's mad, absolutely mad. And it's interesting to see how many people, there's not that many injection molders in the mm -hmm. scene. There's like Rombo and Pictrum and, and that, but like everyone's kind of still doing it by hand for the most part. Right. And I think that's quite, from a collector's point of view, it's quite inspiring to have that because that's real craft. It's not a, it, it takes a long time to bang these out. Exactly, like, yeah. I mean, even if you're cutting with a bandsaw and, and CNCing or whatever, you're still, there's still programming time involved in that and the hand detailed stuff takes forever because you've got to, draw it out and cut it by hand and everything like when you're making them from the top down I know it varies from material to material but how long does it take you to make say an acrylic one on uh, well while I do tend to make a few at a time so it's a little hard to judge I would say if I were to sit down and make a single acrylic pick it would be uh, a half hour process start to finish for an acrylic pick but a single resin pick mm. could take me an hour is resin a lot harder to work with? Then? I, I'd say for me it is. Everyone has their... Like, I've had people tell me they can't stand working with acrylic. 
and I personally can't stand working with wood. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I just for me, uh, that that's part of just why I love working with acrylic. Is I, I just think it's my sweet spot for me, and I can sit down in a half hour and enjoy making uh, an acrylic pick. What's your just coming back to our coming back to our comrades and our peers? Well, your peers. I don't make anything, but your <laughs> your peers in the scene. Um. How do you think the because you've been you've been here proudly supporting the reps since day reps. one, um, which is something for which I'm incredibly grateful. Uh, but how have you, given that your your proximity to it, probably more than anybody else, how have you seen like our community change in the last three and a bit years? It- Especially going from collector to maker. It's kind of been interesting to see, like, um, how... I feel like I've become a little bit disconnected as far as having a personal relationship with other makers go. But I'm pretty proud to see when... You know, I have picks from people that were some of the first picks that they were selling for some of the first stuff they were making. And it's really interesting to see them now have an artist relationship where they're making an artist's pick they're working with bigger companies. Um, and it's a little bit crazy to think mm. like, uh, you know, some of these people weren't making picks a, even just a couple of years ago and seeing them now making picks for bigger artists. Like I think dragon picks has a couple of uh, people. He's like a couple of bands he's making picks for. And so it's just interesting mm. to see like where such a small group of people that didn't exist a few years ago that are now, um, it's it's almost kind of intimidating to think that we're the ones responsible for bringing guitar picks into the wider view. That's actually quite a that's quite a heavy thing to think about because we're so you know we're all in the group chat and having a you know having a daily rattle with each other and mm-hmm. whatever. But actually, um, the modern scene as it as it is now didn't exist at all until really a hand like a handful of years ago because there's people out there like Tom Winspear had been out there for uh, a couple of years prior obviously Vinny Smith and Epo from Chicken Picks have been about for you know since the 80s Vpix has been going mm-hmm. since the 80s uh but the modern era your honeys and zens and pig drums and and all that sort of stuff that's very that's very recent yeah. and it's crazy to think like you know yeah, it's it's a bit Sorry, intimidating bro. because, uh, like you know, the guitars and ca- even cables are very thought into, and people care so much about every detail of the guitar path. You know, you care about the wood that goes in your guitar. You care about what metal is on the end of your cable. You care about the quality of the components in your pedal. It's intimidating to think that we are now responsible for leading the way in the guitar pick, which has unfortunately been so underthought about. I mean, I th- I think a lot of that is just down to the fact that having I spent a lot of my life in music instrument retail, and a lot of players I'll, there's a big gap between playing the guitar and having an interest. In yeah. It. And a lot of people, I mean, I've spoken to guys who've been playing for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, and they don't know about things like why you shouldn't leave an acoustic next to the radiator, or, you know, it matters the fact that you're changing string gauge and all that sort of stuff. So a lot a lot of the peripheral things, especially because picks have always been designed as a consumable, for want mm-hmm. of a better term, they've always been fairly throwaway. And because they are very small, like patch leads or you know pedal boards in a sense until the most recent stuff like your Schmidt mm-hmm. arrays and all that sort of thing. Uh, they've always been seen as a kind of temporary aspect, um, and it's changing in attitude. There was a time when I was actually when I was <laughs> your age, to be honest, but there was a time when uh, when people's pedal boards were not rammed with boutique right. gear. You know, they had like a couple of boss things, a couple of MXRs, and they might have a fancy drive. And when people had like fancy drive pedals, it was like, ooh, 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 do you know what I mean? Um, 
that that attitude has now just changed completely and people are people are building their first boards with all boutique stuff of which is nuts um but that attitude took a long time to change and although you are right in a sense that um, well not in a sense you are right that it's intimidating to be in charge of that surely surely the people that should be in charge of leading that vanguard is not a big company but the individuals who care about it the most right and that's why i that's sort of why i don't push my stuff on somebody or i'm willing to recommend a different maker um i don't think Mm. of it as competition i think in the wider like longer run it's more important for somebody to get interested in it than to only buy from me or to you know i'm not trying to most of the time sell my own product i'm trying to get somebody interested in this and try to make somebody understand why this you know three millimeter acrylic pick can be better for you than that single 0.73 pick you got when you bought your first guitar now on the subject of this james you have to say you you meet somebody who who plays um and they only they play a little bit or they play a lot whatever but they ask you why should i do this why should I go up to the heavy stuff, particularly the heavy stuff? Because the heavy thing is always the thing people struggle to get their head around. It's not I don't actually think it's the financial side. It's the it's the, the, the girth of the picks. As soon as you cross that one one and a half, two mil threshold, people are like, Whoa, 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 <laughs> what are you doing? So what's your case? Your case for the heavy plectrum? Because I believe that this oh man, that is a tough question. <laughs> Everybody gets it though, so it's it's fair. Because I believe this piece of gear is as important as that dial on your uh, amp. Uh, when I go to ch- uh, set up my guitar playing for you know practicing and just playing, I think picking the right guitar pick is as important as the turning of your knob on your amp. I am more likely to change from a metal pick to a wooden pick to change my sound than I am to change the, you know, treble on the amp. And Mm. that's sort of what I'm trying to get people to understand with uh, these picks is I've had uh, people message me and ask, say, uh, ask about the tonal qualities of my picks. And then I've ended up at the end of the conversation, recommending them to Crows Customs or someone else, because I, I believe I, when they tell me what kind of sound they're looking for, I believe I have a knowledge of where to lead them with that. It's a little bit like, it's, a str- it's an odd analogy in a way, it's, it's a little bit like tattooists, mm-hmm. where a good tattooist, if you go to them and say, I want like a biomechanical thing, and they do traditional like sailing ships, Yeah, a good tattooist will say, I'm not going to do that for you, I'll send you to X to get the work done. Because you, the important thing is that the that the end result is correct, rather than you taking it on and saying, "Well, I don't really do this." Yeah, and I've turned down a lot of custom orders before because it's just simply not something I think I am the expert in. I've heard about I've heard about some crazy stuff that people have asked <laughs> for um, from lots of makers. But what what sort of stuff have you been? No, you're not going to get into anybody into any trouble with this. But what sort of stuff have you been asked to make that's not practical? Let's say. Um. Well, to me, something not practical would be something I am not very versed in. So wooden picks are something I'll only I only work with wood at my own pace. I would never make a custom wooden pick for someone just because I cannot. I can't guarantee that I'll be happy with the end result of that. And so mm. I, I love the orders that are a crazy custom shape. Those are the ones that I'll take on. Um, just recently, I had my Valentine's Day picks, which were the Oregon, uh, just a heart-shaped pick. And I had somebody ask me for a thinner, smaller jazz three-sized one, and I was absolutely happy to make those for them. Um, yeah. But if they had asked me to just make a wooden... Uh, wooden or metal or any other material one, I would have had to turn them down just because I don't believe I'm the best at delivering that to them. I think that's fair enough. Mm-hmm. And it's very honest, rather than saying, yeah, well, I'll give it a crack, but you're still paying, you know. Exactly. 
money for it. Yeah. Um, now, at this juncture, I would like to offer you the floor, as I do with everyone, okay. and say, is there anybody you want to give... This is my antidote to the three-person question. But is there anybody that you want to give shout-outs to uh, in the scene or just generally in scene? Well, if this, if by some miracle they're hearing this, uh, Brian May, James Hetfield, uh, give me a call. <laughs> but um, just anyone who's taken a chance, really, on my guitar picks that have believed in what I do. people, Anyone who's bought the Uno, despite how insanely odd it looks. Uh, everyone who's bought a pick for me, you've given me the opportunity to go from someone who is just dumping their money into guitar picks, um, heading into this blindly. You've given me the opportunity to build a job for myself out of this. You've given me the opportunity to do something I'm passionate about and believe in, and something that I can see myself doing years from now. Well, that is a that is a very wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. It's a wonderful thing. And the scene is lucky to have you. Thank you. Quite frankly. Um, so I know it's been I know it's been ages since I said I was going to have you on, but because we're getting close to the anniversary of both of our endeavors yes. from the shop point of view, uh, I didn't think I couldn't have imagined there was a better time. Now, before we before we draw our evening's activities to a close, uh, is there have you can you reveal? should there be such a thing, that you've got stuff on the horizon Ye- for this year for Northern Ghost? I'll just say that for the one-year anniversary coming up here in early March is where I'm aiming. I have put quite a bit of money into some material that is on its way, and I have some projects lined up and some special things that I have working on, both on my own and collaborations and such, that there's some very special things happening in March. Well, that is, because I'll be totally frank, ladies and gentlemen who are listening and all points in between, I don't know what those things are. Right. Um, because I, I'm, and I'm keen not to know in a way, because <laughs> I want to be just as surprised as everybody else. Yes. Um, but it's been incredibly, incredibly wonderful to have my peer friend and colleague, James, on the podcast. Thank you. I would just like to say, if you... If you want to check out James's stuff, you can. I'll leave links in the description and everything else. Uh, James sells his picks through the Heavy Repping Shop. Uh, there will also be a link to that. I'm incredibly proud to have him on there. And uh, do go and check him out if you haven't already. But I would guess if you're listening to the podcast, you probably have. But nevertheless, it's always a firm recommendation. So, James, an absolute pleasure to have yes, you on. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's been two or three years in the making now it's glad i'm glad to have finally done um so i'm going to post this up all and everywhere um if you would like to join us on the podcast again please feel free to do so it just remains for me to say my name is john tron davidson this is heavy repping on the pletraverse podcast and i shall see you soon so remember if you're not sure what to do in life rep hard rep heavy and do the thing